Who's telling the truth about Ukraine? Russia and the U.S. are both accused of manipulating facts to fan the flames of war. So, who will win the information battle for public opinion? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. It's often said that the first casualty of war is the truth. With tensions running high over a potential Russian invasion of Ukraine, all sides have accused each other of spreading misinformation and propaganda. Here are some examples. The separatist leaders of the Donbass region ordered mass evacuations to southern Russia. They say the Ukrainian military is preparing to move into the area. Kiev denies this, and the U.S. calls the evacuation operation a false flag operation by Russia to justify military action. Moscow has long said Ukraine is threatening Russian speakers, even accusing Kiev of genocide. Allow me to add that in our assessment, what's happening now in the Donbass constitutes genocide. The U.S. called the genocide claim a reprehensible falsehood. The State Department says Russia is behind a huge disinformation campaign but Washington has faced criticism as well. The U.S. says Moscow could invade at any moment. Joe Biden repeated the warning despite Ukraine's president saying such information is sowing unnecessary fear. We have reason to believe the Russian forces are planning to uh, and intend to attack Ukraine in the coming week, in the coming days. We believe that they will target Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, a city of 2.8 million innocent people. And do you have any indication about whether President Putin has made a decision on whether to invade? Do you feel confident that he, that he hasn't made that decision already? As of this moment, I'm convinced he's made the decision. We have reason to believe that. Some journalists are questioning the use of flawed intelligence by comparing the situation to the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. Is there a need to provide some underlying evidence of just what you're seeing that shows Americans this is a country that went through Iraq and, and concerns about what the intelligence is showing? Does the administration see a need to just provide underlying intelligence? Well, let me just start with a fundamental distinction between the situation in Iraq and the situation today. In the situation in Iraq, intelligence was used and deployed from this very podium to start a war. We are trying to stop a war, to prevent a war, to, an, to avert a war. And all we can do is come here before you and give good faith and share everything that we know to the best of our ability while protecting sources and methods so we continue to get the access to intelligence we need. All right, let's bring in our guests. Lada Roslitsky is founder and managing partner at Black Trident Defense and Security Consulting Group. She joins us from Kiev. Richard Sakwa is a professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent. He joins us from Kent in the United Kingdom. And joining us by Skype from Munich is Peter Zalmayev, executive director at the Eurasia Democracy Initiative. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Lada, let me start with you today. Uh, tensions right now are soaring about the situation with regard to Russia and Ukraine. From your vantage point, is there anybody, when it comes to the disinformation and misinformation war that's going on between the U.S. and Russia, that is actually winning this battle at the moment? Um, there can be no winner in a psychological operation that terrorizes uh, a population of millions, tens of millions of people. So right now, no, no winners, only losers. Peter, um, Moscow has accused Ukraine of plotting a genocide against ethnic Russians and denounced Ukrainians as Nazi sympathizers. This is the narrative that is being advanced by Russian media outlets. You hear this more and more each and every day. What else are we hearing when it comes to Russian disinformation about Ukraine? Well, first of all, obviously, you have to understand that this is a complete lie and a fabrication. I am originally from the east of Ukraine. I'm a Russian-speaking Ukrainian-American uh, from Donetsk originally. So there's no genocide going on there. It never, never happened there. It is obvious. What we're hearing from Moscow now, obviously, uh, in, uh, is, uh, I mean, what we're seeing from Moscow is attempts to 
uh, you know, uh, make U uh, Ukrainians panic, make Ukrainians afraid. Um, you know, there's current constant flow of information, including coming from Washington, that we still haven't been able to verify the veracity of, such as that uh, Russia has uh, plans to evade the entire country, they're preparing lists of all those uh, activists, such as myself, for example, who are based in Kiev, uh, who have been critical of Russia. Uh, that would be the first, uh, should uh, Russia invade, they would be the first to be arrested, disappeared, shot, etc. So there is, a, there is a, there's that campaign of intimidation that we're seeing that is, I think, a crucial component of Putin's strategy, whether he orders a full country invasion or, or not. Lada, I saw you nodding along to a lot of what Peter was saying there. It looked like you wanted to jump in, so please go ahead. Yeah, I, it, it is um, quite terrorizing to hear about these lists. Uh, that having been said, however, uh, we do need to look back at what happened in 2014 when the Russian special agents were abducting, assassinating uh, Ukrainians en masse in the currently uncontrolled territories. So it is frightening. It's completely unpleasant. It does help in a matter of protecting. For instance, earlier, people had all of their friends' phone numbers in their telephones or on their SIM cards. People that, such as activists who could potentially be on this list are probably a little bit more keen on not having that information on them uh, should they be abducted. Richard, you know, Western governments have been very vocal lately about trying to out Russian online disinformation tactics. This, this is quite different than the response in the past. Is this amped up response because of the fact that Moscow has been successful in tilting public opinion around geopolitical issues in the past? Well, there's two things there. On the geopolitics, uh, this language of disinformation, misinformation is misleading. In some cases, it's useful. Yes. And we'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, what a lot of it is, is a different perspective on the geopolitical situation and the larger historical context. Um, we talked about uh, the 2014 events. And even there, just the statement that was just said is massively exaggerated. And we know that it was a terrible conflict uh, and in the Maidan, uh, the way that in the end, the shooting came from the Maidan insurgents themselves, as a lot of evidence has shown. So it's an absolutely appalling situation. But the key point is that sometimes uh, you it's very dangerous to use the language of disinformation when it's simply policy disagreements. And this goes back not just to Putin, it goes back to Yeltsin, and it goes back to the larger geopolitical context of uh, NATO enlargement. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I agree that the situation is absolutely appalling and I have every sympathy for the inhabitants of Ukraine, but then also for Russia, which has been suffering for years of sanctions, when these sanctions are, have, a lot of them have been imposed to ensure that Russia fulfills the Minsk Accords, when it was obviously Kiev which had to take the initiative on them. And so that is unjust. And so I think we need to step back a bit from this language of disinformation, which has been going on for many years. So it's not just been amped up now. It's worse now than it has been before. Let's listen to the serious arguments. And I think both sides have exaggerated massively. Let's call it well, an old fashioned word, propaganda. Lada, I saw you uh, shaking your head uh, to some of what uh, uh, Richard was saying there. So it looked like you wanted to jump in again. So go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, no country after the Second World War has changed international borders. So when we discuss geopolitics and human civil political rights, uh, the Russian Federation does have a lot to explain and be held accountable for, including the terrible tragedy of MH17. That having been said, I believe that globally, uh, truth has been deconstructed completely. So, of course, everybody has a right to their perspective. Everybody has a right to their opinion. At the end of the day, it is the responsibility of wise people with integrity to know the truth and defend human civil political rights, which have been codified after the atrocities of the First and Second World War. This is very important. Peter, um, U.S. intelligence agencies have been declassifying information, saying that they believe that Vladimir <clears throat> Putin plans to invade Ukraine, and then they've been sharing it widely. Is this strategy, because, because this does seem to be a, a pretty big change in strategy from the past, 
Is this making it more difficult for Vladimir Putin to justify an invasion? I'm visiting the Munich Security Conference, and I just stepped away from uh, a Ukrainian luncheon that is happening right now with uh, former dignitaries, former uh, defense minister J James Mattis, uh, G D General David Petraeus, Dmitry Kuleba, the Ukrainian foreign minister, just arrived and will be speaking. So there's a lot of talk about Western unity uh, in support of Ukraine. And it seems like most, most folks are on board with Joe Biden's strategy, which I'll tell you, as a, just a, as, a, as a private person, it's been hard for me to be taking to be opening up New York Times every morning and to see that an invasion is happening, it's imminent, it's going to happen any day now. Now we're talking about these lists, you know, um, of people who will be disappeared should uh, Putin invade. Obviously, this is part of the strategy. Whether Putin invades or not, it's already working. Uh, it's, not, it's working not only in Ukraine and on Ukrainian minds, but it's working on officials' minds throughout the world. Uh, you know, so that, that's what you call a credible threat, whether there is a, you know, an, a, an invasion in mind that Vladimir Putin has. You cannot discount this as a, as, an, uh, as, a, as a possibility, even though by all accounts, it seems like it will be a suicidal step for Vladimir Putin, simply because he just won't be able to, uh, okay, he'll be able to invade a part of Ukraine's territory. Will he be able to occupy it for any long period of time? That's a much harder question. And let me just very briefly respond to the previous speaker when we mentioned Minsk agreements and we mentioned that both sides have sinned when it comes to disinformation. Let me just ask maybe a rhetorical question or maybe a direct question to him. Does he really believe what's happening in the east of Ukraine with the shelling of uh, civilian population centers that Ukraine, as as, as as the Kremlin claims that Ukraine is now doing this after having a hundred, almost 200,000 Russian troops on the borders, does he really believe that Ukraine is attacking? That is disinformation in action. That is the false flag operation in full view that Biden, uh, the Biden administration has been warning about. We're seeing it, you know, in real time. Richard, that's a direct question to you from Peter. So I'm going to let you go ahead and respond. Well, I'm going to go back a couple of steps. Uh, Lada said, and I agree with the overall sentiment, that we have to base uh, every analysis on facts. But the question at the moment, and this intense war fever on all sides, uh, has uh, led to the distortion of facts. The borders have changed. We've seen it with Kosovo, we've seen it with Goa, we've seen it with a whole stack of other elements. It's not to justify it, but simply to say that uh, the uh, borders have been changed. And it's appalling because the 1945 system precisely tries to avoid forced and non-consensual uh, uh, moving of borders. As for MH17, it's an absolute tragedy. But are we suggesting that they went out that day, the insurgents, to shoot down the civilian airliner? Obviously not. The aim was uh, as an intensing, intensifying war. Uh, we know that there were the Geneva Accords of April 2014, which Ukraine walked away from. There was a deal on the table which could have avoided all of this, and yet they failed to achieve and to talk to their own people in the Donbass. They failed to talk to their own citizens in the Donbass, which could have avoided this appalling conflict. And as for the shelling now, we know that for years now, there have been mutual shelling on both sides, that Donetsk is right on the front line. At the moment, uh, is right on the front line, and citizens and civilians have been under shelling and firing and sniper attacks for years, and we had to sort it out. And the failure of Germany and France in particular to put pressure on Kiev to fulfill what we're talking about, a very basic normal thing, which is a level of devolution. It can happen in Italy, it can happen in Spain, it can happen in Canada. For some reason, we give Ukraine a pass when we could have found a diplomatic solution. And so we end up today Easy. with this appalling situation where you have, well, I don't know whether a figure of 200,000, but we certainly have far too many forces on the side. We have 130,000 Ukrainian troops also uh, um, facing against uh, the, Don, the, the, the Donbass. Richard. So it's an appalling, dangerous, dangerous Richard, situation. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but, but, but Lada wants to jump in. Go ahead. Yes. I think it really would be nice of you to answer the question that, that you were asked. And actually, every country has a right to have an army. And the fact that Ukraine has one and is defending it is actually something that every single country should be doing, not surrounding foreign countries and threatening them with cyber attacks. Like
psychological attacks, killing, abduction. Please answer the question that our co-person uh, um, has asked you. I would, I'm also very curious to hear how you will answer it. Richard, did you want to respond to that? Well, to the specific question, yes, I do believe at the moment that uh, the shelling which uh, has been taking place, uh, there has been misattribution. But uh, the, my point is that later you must understand the context, which is the fact that the Donbass are Ukrainian citizens. Of course, now 700,000 odd have Russian passports. But I'm astonished that Kiev has not been able to talk to its own people. It wants these parts back. It wants these two parts of these two uh, oblasts back. And yet they refuse to talk to their own people, citizens whom they claim are their own. It's, it's, it's been a dead end. And so clearly at the moment, we're in a moment of extraordinary war fever. So there's disinformation and lies um, going on. And as for forces being allowed to mobilize, Russia, of course, apart from those in, uh, in Belarus, are on their own territory. And can I just mention one other thing about the Munich Security Conference? Richard, Richard, let me let, let me let, let, let me let yeah. you get to that point in a bit, because we are starting to run out of time. And I do want to ask Peter a question here. Uh, Peter, right. from your perspective, um, is it counterproductive for the U.S. and for NATO to continue to state that they believe that an invasion is imminent? I mean, has that helped or has that hurt? Uh, listen, uh, once again, we're in uncharted waters, and even the Washington will admit that this is sort of sort of a megaphone diplomacy that they've engaged in has not been tried to that same extent before. Only history will judge. In the next few days, weeks, months, we will know. Uh, my take is that you know we are probably still not looking at a full country invasion simply because Putin is uh, probably incapable of doing it right now. It's going to come with a very high cost. We are in for the long haul. For as long as Vladimir Putin is in power, he will not be at peace with uh, uh, an independent Ukraine. You have to understand that. Uh, so uh, when, while, while I say that about the informational pol you know, policy, I will say that there, is a, there needs to be a, a note of caution inserted into the uh, sanctions policy. And this is something that Fiona Hill, Donald Trump's former security advisor, said that, you know, uh, when it comes to the sanctions policy, whether signaling that sanctions are coming regardless of what Vladimir Putin does, may backfire simply because Russians will think, well, we have nothing to lose. Let's go ahead. So there needs to be some note of caution. Uh, there is, a, I'm seeing a, a somewhat optimistic sign that Vladimir, uh, that Mr. Lavrov and, Bl uh, and, and Blinken uh, are supposed to meet on the 24th of February. So b b the hope is that nothing will happen before then. And for as long as diplomats are talking, the guns are, sta are staying silent. Let me just one, one more minute just to refer once again to what this previous speaker said when he continues harping on the issue while the, the Ukrainian government has refused um, and again to speak with ostensible, you know, uh, people of the Donbass. There are no people of the Donbass to speak with. These are puppet regimes that, that are controlled directly from Moscow. And the part of the strategy is to push this Minsk agreements down Ukraine's throats, uh, which will be the same. It will be tant tantamount to Ukraine's cap capitulation through other less painful uh, you know, means for Russia, short of an invasion. Minsk means uh, a stop to Ukraine's aspirations uh, to have an independent foreign policy, to become a member of NATO and to become a member of the EU. Lada, let me ask you a similar question uh, to what I just asked Peter, from your perspective, are there inherent risks to this campaign by the U.S., by NATO, by other Western countries? I mean, if these warnings about an imminent invasion continue to grow more dire and an invasion does not happen, what does that do? Well, it's discrediting the um, state system at the end of the day uh, on, a, on an international global uh, level. Internally, what it does to the citizens who are the victims of this type of um, diplomacy or, or propaganda, as you will, uh, is actually quite quite heavy. People are exhausted. People are terrified. Uh, and actually, the level of anti-American rhetoric has been raising in the couple in the past few weeks, particularly not only because of this. Um, abundance of information and, and the addressing of which date it's going to happen, which is completely ridiculous. Uh, also, the, uh, the, the perception that you 
Ukraine has been abandoned by its main Western allies, by them pulling out of Kiev, by pulling out uh, of the special monitoring mission of the OSCE, rather than really supporting and, and calling more experts into Ukraine, into Kiev. The fact that they have pulled out and have now placed themselves in Lviv, not all of them, but, but most Western allies have either already moved to Lviv or are considering doing so which again creates this uh, perception that it's going to be so much easier to kill the people in the, 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 the city um, because we don't have our allies here to protect us. They should have sent more SMM uh, monitors rather than pulling them out. Richard, I know you had a point you wanted to finish making. I'll let you do that. But I also want to ask you when it comes to the fact that the U.S., uh, that other Western countries have been so public in sharing this intelligence that they have gathered. How unusual is that? Uh, well, I mean, it's uh, intelligence. We know in the Russiagate uh, a business, the intelligence kept being fed out into the public domain. And we know, as it's been even admitted by some Washington officials, that uh, the media is complicit together with uh, inform so-called information from the security services, which is, uh, as we saw with the uh, alleged collusion between Trump and Putin in 2016, it turned out to be utterly false. And uh, I'm not saying it's false now. I'm simply saying it's part of this new method. So there's nothing particularly new about certainly the Anglo-American use of in intelligence mm -hmm. fed into the media to achieve a certain political effects. As for the larger issue, can I just say, as for Minsk, and I think one of the previous speakers uh, was very honest in saying that Minsk is unimplementable, then uh, a simple question emerges. Every six months, the European Union has been smashing sanctions onto Russia for its failure to fulfill Minsk, and now we have it quite openly. Well, um, Kiev had no intention ever, and I understand the arguments, by the way, why um, uh, Kiev wouldn't like to implement Minsk, because clearly it was a forced solution and there's other issues involved. But at least let's be honest, and I'm glad to hear the honesty emerging, that Minsk was not going to be implemented. Fine. Let's find some other format in which we can return these Donbass um, parts to Ukrainian sovereignty while ensuring mm -hmm. that the uh, issues within the Donbass, you know, that there's a, a fair solution in that society. Mm. As for the Munich Security Conference, the failure way back in February 2017, exactly 15 years ago, when Putin uh, made that famous speech denouncing a unipolar world and all the rest. The fact that at that moment there was unity against him and everybody was so proud that uh, Putin's attempt to drive a wedge between the partners. And look, it's not a question of driving wedges or unity. This unity at the moment is the unity on the march of folly. Let's listen to the serious arguments. And I absolutely agree with the previous speaker. The diplomatic process is continuing mm -hmm. with a meeting hopefully by the end of next week. Uh, Peter, um, we just have about a minute, 30 seconds left. Uh, let me just ask you, when it comes to the pro-Kremlin disinformation machine, how does the domestic disinformation operation differ from the foreign media operation? If you're asking about Ukraine, right? Yes. Uh, well, you know, um, so far, I mean, what, what we've actually seen has been a sort of tension between Ukraine, the Ukrainian central government, and yeah. the, the American administration, uh, the, Biden, by, uh, the Biden's White House. Uh, the Vladimir Putin has been at pains to actually keep Ukrainians calm. And up to, till now, even now that tensions have risen, uh, there's much more concern now, uh, including on the streets of Ukrainian cities. The government, the Ministry of Defense continues insisting that they're not seeing signs of an imminent invasion, let alone of a uh, occupation of the entire country. So there's a little bit of a tension that uh, viewers should be aware about. All right. Well, we have uh, run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Lada Roslitsky, Richard Sakwa, and Peter Zalmayev. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.